do something fun. Let's talk about anaphylaxis. And let's talk about anaphylaxis as a game. But this is no child's game. This is a game where you need to save the life of your patient. And the reason because it's a game is because same way as anaphylaxis, you have a monster in front of you that's trying to kill you. And you're trying to kill the monster. And you throw in some adrenaline, epinephrine, some steroids, antihistamines. And there's some things in your way that makes the game more difficult and it makes your job more difficult. And this is how anaphylaxis looks like. <laughs> I know what some of you are thinking, that anaphylaxis is kind of boring, that you know everything needs to be known about anaphylaxis. And that may be true, but it's also true that we do a terrible job taking care of anaphylaxis. We misdiagnose about 50% of our patients. And from the ones who need epinephrine, we only give it to 50% of them. Only 40% will go home with an epinephrine auto-injector and only one in five will get the appropriate follow-up and education. So we may know everything needs to be known, but we do a terrible job taking care of these patients. And anaphylaxis is an allergic or allergic type of reaction with end organ damage. That is the most important thing. And it will affect about one to 2% of the population. And about one to 2% will die. And 2% from 2% doesn't seem to be much. We deal with far little things on a daily basis. Trauma, sepsis, MIs. But the difference is, deaths from anaphylaxis are highly preventable with good education, with good clinical management, and with good access. Nobody should die from anaphylaxis. And this is the monster. <laughs> Anaphylaxis is a sudden onset, rapidly progressing, multi-system organ failure. And it's related to the activation and degranulation of mast cells. And uh, my professors in med school in Chile, they spent a lot of time trying to make the distinction between anaphylactic and anaphylactoid. But it makes no difference. It's not important for us. We're going to treat both the same way. What is important is that anaphylaxis is becoming more common because the incidence is going up and because we're doing a better job recognizing it. But although we do a better job recognizing it, many times flies under our radar. If a patient shows up in your ER and your ICU and your ambulance and is red as a tomato, hypotensive, and in respiratory failure, that's an easy diagnosis. But sometimes these patients show up only with hypotension or may have bad vomiting and diarrhea with no skin findings or even profound shock without skin findings. And then the diagnosis is a little bit more difficult. And we need to make the diagnosis because fatal anaphylaxis is super fast progressing. In cases of fatal anaphylaxis from bee stings, time from a sting to arrest is 15 minutes. And in cases of drug reactions, time from exposure to arrest is only five minutes. So we need to make the diagnosis and we need to make it fast. Typically what happens is we misdiagnose this anaphylaxis as a bad allergic reaction. And the truth is your patient's probably gonna survive your misdiagnosis and your mismanagement. But the problem is a week after, a month after, a year after, when they have the second episode of anaphylaxis, they don't know what it is, they don't know what to do, and they don't have an epinephrine auto injector. So your patient may survive the first encounter but the second encounter may kill the patient. And anaphylaxis kills something like this. Anaphylaxis kills you first by shock, significant basoplegia and bad perfusion also by hypoxia, secondary to the bronchospasm and the airway obstruction. And also, something that we forget often, 
because of myocardial dysfunction, ischemia, arrhythmia, and quite a bit of myocardial dysfunction. So we need to keep that in mind. Those are the three major mechanisms. But as important as the hypotension of the respiratory failure, lack of education and lack of access also kills your patient. Lack of education to providers, that they don't recognize anaphylaxis early on, and they don't provide epinephrine. Also, lack of education to our patients to recognize what's going on and how it's different from an allergic reaction. And lack of access to well-functioning, well-mature EMS systems that can deal with this sort of situation. And of course, lack of access to epinephrine auto-injectors. This is how anaphylaxis kills you. But you are the hero. You're the hero of this game. Sometimes you're the only thing between death and your patient. And this is your job. This is how you play the game. You try to save your patient. And you need to know your enemy. And we just talked about anaphylaxis. But also you need to know your laser beam. You need to know your rockets, which is epinephrine. And I know that the evidence behind epinephrine or adrenaline and anaphylaxis is not great. There's no randomized controlled trial of adrenaline and anaphylaxis. And probably there will never be one. But the best available evidence that we have available to us is telling that adrenaline is the only thing that may change outcomes, particularly mortality outcomes. So please, use adrenaline and use it early. And how adrenaline works, how epi works, number one, improves peripheral vascular resistance and perfusion. Number two, improves bronchospasm. Number three, helps with cardiac output. Number four, helps with uh, coronary perfusion. And something that is important, also helps with inflammation, with the inflammatory process that is driving the anaphylaxis. This is important to know. And this is you. This is the resuscitation part of this game. This is how you save your patient. First step is to diagnose anaphylaxis. And on top of diagnosing anaphylaxis, you need to identify people who is at high risk of fatal anaphylaxis. And who is at high risk of fatal anaphylaxis? Young children, elderly people, patients with cardiorespiratory comorbidities, asthma especially, people with history of severe anaphylaxis, and patients with exposure to tree nuts, particularly peanuts. Those people is at high risk of fatal anaphylaxis. And once you have made the diagnosis, please never wait for hypotension before doing epinephrine, or never wait for respiratory failure before epinephrine. You make the diagnosis of anaphylaxis, and then you give them epinephrine. And the first line is intramuscular epinephrine. Not SUQ, never subcutaneous epinephrine. I don't even want to talk about that. The first line is intramuscular. And once in a blue moon, you may need to do IV first but the vast majority of the time is IM. And from people who require epinephrine, 50%, one in two, will require a second dose of adrenaline. And the second line, the second dose is also intramuscular. And from them, a significant amount will progress into refractory anaphylaxis, which is a rather difficult situation that we may talk in a second. And when you're dealing with refractory anaphylaxis, you need to go the way of the adrenaline infusion, the epinephrine drip. And I know some of you are a little bit concerned about the adverse reactions with epinephrine and anaphylaxis. They're real, and they do happen. But most of the time, they happen because it's the, it's the wrong dose or the wrong route. And the interesting thing, the important thing is, the people who's at high risk of fatal anaphylaxis elderly and cardiorespiratory comorbidities is also the people who is at high risk of adverse events. Don't be afraid. In patients with anaphylaxis, adrenaline outweighs the risk of anaphylaxis. So please, don't be afraid and use it. 
And while you're doing your epinephrine management on one side, you need to be doing some other things. First, remember to decontaminate the patient. Sometimes we forget to remove the clothes or remove the bee sting or the food exposure. Very important. Second, these patients need a lot of crystalloids. Remember that they're very vasoplegic, so they need a lot of crystalloids. If they're in respiratory failure, oxygen and bronchodilators, salbutamol or something like that. But remember that epinephrine is also a great bronchodilator, so don't forget that part. And you may consider using steroids and antihistamines. The evidence behind steroids and antihistamines is rather weak. There's minimal evidence. Certainly, they're not going to change any outcomes. They may make your management a little bit easier in terms of symptoms, but they will not save your patient. Consider using them. Please, use them. But never delay epinephrine and never delay fluids while you're doing the second line agents. And this is probably one of the most difficult things that you will face in your career. And this is probably a talk on itself. The management of airway and anaphylaxis. This is a really, 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 really difficult airway. It's anatomically difficult, secondary to the angioedema or airway edema. It's physiologically difficult, secondary to the in extremis situation of this patient, hypoxic, tachycardic, tachypneic. It's also difficult because of the airway pressures are very high. And I caused, some years ago, uh, bilateral pneumothoraces and a PEA arrest while I was intubating somebody with anaphylaxis. So this is a really difficult airway. And there's no one size fits all. Some patients will be OK with direct laryngoscopy. Some patients will require fiber optics. Some patients will require a surgical airway. But the key part of the management of airway and anaphylaxis is this is not a single player game. This is not a solo player game. This is a multiplayer game. You need to have everybody in your system line up to play this game. From your paramedics, your emergency medicine people, your intensivist, your anesthesiologist, your surgeons. Everybody needs to be on the same page. This is a multiplayer game. And the next level is probably the most difficult level. Refractory anaphylaxis, the patient that is dying despite epinephrine, the patient that is dying despite an adrenaline drip. The problem with refractory anaphylaxis is the evidence, the guidance about what to do in this situation is just not there. It's just based on case reports and very tiny case series. So this is very complicated. But my first advice, and probably my best advice is, when you walk into a patient dying from anaphylaxis with refractory anaphylaxis, you need to be like a ninja. You need to be fast, you need to be strong, and you need to be precise, because the patient doesn't have a lot of time in front of you. First recommendation is just go up, dial up on the adrenaline or epinephrine infusion. There's no real ceiling in anaphylaxis. Just go up as much as you can. Second advice, particularly if your patient is taking some beta blockers, use glucagon to provide some support that is independent of the uh, cyclic AMP route. Beyond that, the next three things I'm going to say is just case reports. But it may save the day, so just keep it in your mind. Number one is adding norepinephrine to your epidrip. Some reports that improves outcomes. Second thing, adding vasopressin to the epinephrine infusion. Again, a few case reports. And number three is using methylene blue to support these patients with refractory anaphylaxis. There's a few more cases reports with uh, methylene blue, but again, the evidence is not great. Those are some tricks that may save the day. But like you're in India, you need to be precise, you need to be strong, you need to have an exit strategy. And your exit strategy may look like this. Everybody 
everybody lo loves ECMO around here. And ECMO may be your exit strategy, particularly if the patient is in refractory shock despite maximum vasopressor support. If your patient remains hypoxic or hypercarbic despite maximum vent ventilatory management. Or if your patient has a significant cardiac dysfunction be because of the anaphylaxis, they may benefit from ECMO. But as you know, if you're gonna consider ECMO, consider it early on. Don't wait for your patient to deteriorate too much before you start doing this. And we are just finishing the part of resuscitation. This is how you win the resuscitation. <laughs> You win the resuscitation with early diagnosis of anaphylaxis, with early epinephrine, aggressive resuscitation, multidisciplinary airway management, and aggressive escalation and refractory anaphylaxis. This is how you win the resuscitation. But as important as the resuscitation is, the post-resuscitation phase is as important. And the big question here is the biphasic reactions. And Actually, do they even exist? There's papers that show that they're as common as 20%, and some recent papers that show that it's basically non-existent, less than 1%. The truth is in between, and the reason because the numbers are so different is because they use different criteria for anaphylaxis, they use different criteria for clinically significant anaphylaxis, and they use different uh, management protocols. So what is the number? It's probably less than 5%. It's probably in the ballpark of 2%. So 2% of your patients will experience a clinically significant biphasic reaction. And when you deem them safe, when you deem them safe to go home, your patients need two things. <laughs> They need education, and they need an epinephrine auto-injector. Education about what anaphylaxis is and how it's different from an allergic reaction. Education about allergen avoidance. Education about what to do with the next episode of anaphylaxis, what is called the action plan. And education about how to use an epinephrine auto-injector. And of course, they need the epinephrine auto-injector. And I know it's not available in, in every single country. And some of the countries that is available, like United States, went from $60 in 2006 to $600 in 2016. That is just not okay. We need to make the case to our authorities in our countries that epinephrine is a critical access drug. And also we need to hack as a community, including our patients, the main issue of the access to epinephrine auto-injectors. And we're dealing with the end of this game. Just to summarize, early diagnosis of anaphylaxis, you need to know your enemy. Early epinephrine, and with that great power comes great responsibility. The right patient, the right dose, and the right route. You are the hero of this game, and you need to be aggressive and consider aggressive escalation and refractory anaphylaxis. You need to send your patients home with a lot of education, and you need to give them an epinephrine out injector. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, I've never quite seen anaphylaxis presented so beautifully. Since it's nearly afternoon tea, we might just take a comment or two, if that's okay. David, what did people think? Yeah, I mean, everyone loved the talk. I think what people were blown away by the computer stuff, and I think there's gonna be a lot of people emailing you to uh, help them with their next talks. Happy to help. Yeah, well done. <laughs> Thank really you well very done. much.